everyone. So this is our compost consultation. It should take up to 30 minutes, probably less. We're going to go over what you're hoping to get out of your worm composting experience. Um, okay. Do you have any questions before we begin? No, I just really don't know a lot about it. And I'm hoping to integrate it to improve our gardens without having any negative impact on the bees. So I don't fertilize anything. Right. So you're primarily a, an apiary, a bee farm? Our primary goal or, or primary purpose of honeypot apiaries is to create a biodiverse environment for the bees. But that also includes um, food and surplus produce and fruits. So we have um, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, elderberries, and then a variety of um, vegetables. Okay. So you can't be using insecticides and no synthetic fertilizers, no synthetic inputs in your farm. No, I would rather have a weaker plant and something more, something that won't harm the bees because I am really super uncomfortable with anything on the market that says natural, organic, because if it's blue, it doesn't, you know, and a lot of them are pellets and I just, um, I'm just not comfortable with it at all. So oftentimes my produce isn't um, as vibrant as I see on the cover of Mother Earth News. <laughs> Can you tell me about how you're currently composting? One of my purposes is to keep kitchen scraps out of the landfill. So I separate my garbage and I put um, kitchen scraps that I don't have any cheese, don't have any meat. Otherwise, it's pretty liberal. I limit my citrus rinds um, to a separate area because they don't seem to break down at all. And um, I have a kitchen bucket under the sink. And when that's full, it's like a two and a half gallon bucket. I bring it out to a garbage can and, I, and the garbage can has pre-drilled holes in it. And I have three of those. And the first garbage can, I have a layer of dirt or mulch, and then I throw the kitchen scraps, and then I put another layer of mulch or dirt, whatever I've composted up in the past. And that has to be um, pretty heavy because of animals. It can't have any smell at all because we'll have bears and raccoons. And so when the first garbage can's full, I just put a bungee cord over it, go to the second one, fill that up, go to the third one. And then when the third one's full, I dump the first one in the dirt mulch pile and I just mix it up and I just keep doing that all summer. Well, for three full seasons, mm -hmm. except in, free, in uh, frozen ground. So it's not very scientific in it, but the dirt's pretty good. So that's really cool. You're essentially already worm composting. You're just not using the worms or bents. Um... With worm composting, the way we do it is we have um, a worm bin. The bottom's covered in dirt, just like your garbage can. We put our food scraps in, and then we cover it with dirt, identical to your garbage can. We separate out our citrus because, like you had noticed, it doesn't break down. The reason we remove it for the worms is because the citrus will increase the acidity level in the soil, and the worms have a covering on their skin that helps them breathe and that acidity can affect their skin so they won't go near the citrus or break it down either and we also remove dairy and meat and fats or meat fats from our compost so you're already doing these things that would be just a change for most people but the cool thing is you're already doing it so rather than putting it into your um your trash cans, what I would recommend is you start a simple worm bin and there's literally going to be no change other than you'll have red wiggler worms breaking down your food scraps compared to taking your food scraps after they break down and throwing them into a compost pile and constantly turning them. Once they're in the bin and they're finished, they're ready to use. So you won't have all the turning process. What do you mean ready to use? Like on what? On anything, the cool thing with worm castings is it's pH neutral at 7, and everything is broken down so there's no hot components. So with lots of fertilizers and um, manures and even organic, you know, compost or fertilizer inputs, 
they can start to break down again while they're near your plants and they can reach temperatures of 180 degrees. And when the root zone reaches temperatures like that, the plant can die, can get burned, can get severe nutrient deficiencies. So with worm castings, because they're completely finished, there's nothing for it to break down. There's no heat potential. You can throw it as much as you want directly on the roots. You can germinate seedlings directly in castings. Whereas, I mean, you can't put seedlings right in manure and expect them to grow well. So the cool thing is once it's out of your worm bin, you can use it as you please and really any quantity you want to. Um, you're not going to want to overuse it because you want it to be spread out over your farm. Um, but you won't have that risk of dealing with synthetic man-made stuff or hot compost that can harm your plants. So that's what I mean by it's, it's ready to use once the worms are done with it. Now, I did try um, a big green thing, worm bin. What is that called again? The hungry bin. A hungry bin. And I found that I liked uh, the compost that it produced, but it was very hard to harvest. And then it didn't, like, the pan took a long time to create the worm castings. And then it didn't go very far for me. But I also found it very difficult to harvest it because it was heavy, awkward. So many of the worms fell out with it. I wasn't sure whether I should put the worms back and I didn't end up with a quantity of anything that was significantly usable. Right. We use the hungry bin and it, it's really convenient, but yeah, if you limit a good amount of upper body strength, it is an incredibly difficult device to use. And one of the drawbacks too is with red wigglers, they really are only in the top few inches of the soil surface. And there's not much square footage in the hungry bin. It's more of like your trash can setup where it's more vertical space than horizontal space. So you can only get so many worms in it. And for more than a, a small family, they have a difficult time keeping up with your inputs. And so it just, it, it takes a while. Once it gets going, it does produce, but it's tough to use if you have any sort of back issue or upper body issue or even just limited upper body strength. Um, it's a challenging piece of equipment. So your worm composting experience was more limited by the ergonomics of your device. What did you think of the castings that did come out of it? I thought that it was incredibly useful. Um, you know, it had no odor and uh, the plants definitely responded. I started using it. I have um, a series of raised beds and they're six by three and I have them almost planted um, in two, three by three. Like I have it separated three by threes um, patches of garden, almost like a square foot gardening issue. And um, so I would use it on half of the raised bed. So I would use a three by three square for each harvest and it really did seem to improve the plants remarkably no experience with compost teas correct no I, in fact i don't even have an idea of what that is to although it, it tried to sell it to me <laughs> who did a kid a 4-h project she was selling oh. nurses uh daughter was selling like bottles of um compost tea oh but, that's great yeah. Well, what compost tea is, is it's brewed earthworm castings. So they're full of beneficial microbes. It's like a little probiotic. You take, a, I take a cup of earthworm castings, put it in a little burlap bag. Throw it in a five gallon bucket with an air pump. So it's agitated constantly. Um, you want to foster the good bacteria, which feeds on oxygen, aerobic bacteria. So you pump a five gallon bucket with, um, air with your burlap sack of worm castings and you add some sort of carbohydrate i like organic molasses as a honey farmer you might want to try some honey that might work well but the carbohydrate is what feeds the bacteria and as they feed on the carbohydrate they grow in population grow in population grow in population so after approximately two days you have this supercharged slurry of beneficial bacteria and microbes for your plants 
and you can give this out over a much larger area than just that one cup of worm castings could ever do because you can dilute the solution up to 10 times so you can turn your five gallons into 50 gallons and easily wow. cover quite a large area with it and the reason why the microbes are so important especially with an organic farm that doesn't use any synthetic fertilizer is those are what break down the material in the soil into a form your plants can actually use so you might have big chunks of um, old mulch from a tree that decomposed a thousand years ago. There's a lot of good nutrition in that for plants, but it takes the microbes to break it down into a small enough form that the plant can use. So the more of these microbes you get into your soil, the faster they're able to break down this organic material and your plants can use that up for nutrition. And the microbes can also act as um, a pest or pathogen deterrent. They can work like the beneficial bacteria on your skin. That's why you don't want to use antibacterial soap as it kills the good bacteria that fights off the bad bacteria. Well, you can coat your plants in the good bacteria just like your skin has to fight off pathogens. So for someone that can't use insecticides, this will help fight off pathogens that'll make your plants weak and prone to pests or disease. Um, and I like to do that with a foliar spray um, once a month at, at most. And that really is effective in reducing your plant's susceptibility to pests and pathogens. Um, and it also helps drop nutrients from the soil. I'm not sure how it does that, um, but it will. you'll notice a profound effect when you foliar sp spray your plants with compost tea. And you can dilute that at 10 times. I, I dilute my foliar sp sprays by 10, 10 times. Um, so if you're going all foliar, that five gallons can turn into 50 gallons piece of cake. Um, so there's just endless possibilities with worm casting. So one, one cup can make a big difference for your farm. Wow, looking forward to that because I know healthier plants are just healthier plants and much less susceptible to whatever pests do come along. You know, they're not destroyed overnight. And I can adapt to them, but um, healthier plants are healthier plants. So, and it seems like if I can water it, I would be able to control it more than just placing dirt around a plant. Yeah. Um, I can't remember which plant I put in the gas <laughs> a month later. <laughs> so right. it, it didn't occur very evenly. <laughs> yeah, it's that the, the benefits of compost tea are... Just, I'm, I love it. And you can do so much with it. Um, and if you don't have the time to make it into a foliar spray, once it's done, just go dump your five gallon bucket of compost tea on a plant you want to boost up. Um, so you don't have to dilute it. You're not going to burn your plants. Um, you know, with bottled nutrients or synthetic fertilizers, if you make a, an error in calculation, it, it can have a real detrimental effect on your plant. So you don't have to worry about that with the compost tea, which is pretty cool. You can really give as much as you're up for making to your plants. They'll, they'll tolerate it and appreciate it. And you can show me an easy setup. If you'd like, we, we can build the worm bin for you. Um, we can easily make it ergonomic. So you don't have to bend, stoop, lift anything other than putting the compost into the top. Um, we have doors that fold down. So all you do is, scrape the compost into a bucket that sits underneath it. Um, we can do an in-person consultation where I'll run through um, all the ins and outs of the worm bin, how to care for the worms, and how to use the castings once they're done. So we could do a, a simple setup on how to do compost teas as well. That'd be great if you could just come see the layout I have because I have a separate, you know, it's not permaculture, but I have an edible landscape right around the house. I have the 15 raised beds. That's the primary food source for the house closer. And then I have um, a small orchard. So it's uh, three separate small setups that I have. And so, yeah, like I'm also busy and don't want to learn a whole lot of complicated other things to do, especially this time of year. So if you can make it easy, 
I would love to integrate that because I could definitely see where my plants could use a boost and I'm absolutely not willing to use any fertilizers at all. The cool thing is you've already made it easy. Um, the only difference will be is instead of putting your kitchen scraps that you've already separated into that um, trash can and then taking that out and mixing it up with your tractor over and over, you're just going to put it into the worm bin once and take it out when it's harvested. So that, what we build is a horizontal migrating worm bin. So the bulk of the surface area is spread out horizontally. So it's tailored for the red wigglers. So it gets maximum surface area. And we can also put it up on legs so you don't have to bend or do anything. It's just at your working height. So you can dump stuff in easily and get it out easily. Um, I know great. you were worried about that. Of uh, making the kitchen scraps more useful because my primary purpose was to keep it on the landfill and at, and you know have a little usable dirt at the end of really six to 18 months it takes to break down to make usable soil for a, a raised bed on um, the way I'm doing it. So on our farm we find that our kitchen scraps and food inputs are broken down um, well within 30 days. So oh anything you put in It'll be 100% finished within 30 days. And um, it takes a little time to get your worm bin up to capacity. Um, for, it takes a while for that environment to establish. It took us about two months before they were operating at that rate. But, boy, it's incredible. It's hard to keep up with them um, once they're going. So you'll be able to produce quite a bit of worm castings. It's, it'll be all about how much you put in is what you get out of it um and it'll happen quickly so um, okay so we can get working on that for you and with the in-person consultation it'll be the setup of the worm bin we'll build for you we'll bring the worms for you so we'd like you to save up um, maybe a five gallon buckets worth of compost for that day um, we'll be in touch um probably a week ahead of time so you can save up some compost. Okay. We'll bring worms. You'll feed it the compost. You'll care for it the first time under my direction. And it should take an hour or less. And you'll be comfortable managing the worm bin. And we can do a quick compost tea setup as well. You'll be comfortable making your first compost tea at the end of the consultation. Sounds perfect. I'm having a okay. hard time. I'll be comfortable making compost tea because I always thought it was more complicated. But can you go over again, like you said, um, the compost that I'm saving from the kitchen, no citrus. Was there any other restrictions? I don't do eggs or meat now. Meat? I, I don't do, I do eggs, but I don't do. Um, eggs are good. Cheese. Well, so. not necessarily. You want to be careful with eggs. So the egg shells are awesome. Okay. So ideally you want to rinse the shells out and okay. dry them or because the yolks, because of that fat and inability for oxygen to penetrate that yolky material, it can foster that bad anaerobic bacteria. So eggshells are great because when they're dried and crushed up, they provide grit that um, earth or worms need to digest your compost. So like I said, they're, they're good, but can be bad if they're not properly cared for before going into the worm bin. So let them dry out. Right. So from what you told me about your compost, I don't think you have to separate or do anything differently. We tend to put limited amounts of root vegetables like potatoes and onions in just because it takes a long time to break down. But if you're not in any hurry, they'll break down in two months at most in your worm bin. But we keep them out just because they take a while to, to break down. So all those other op or items you remove from your worm bin could go into another compost pile. But I'd recommend for meat and um, like yolks from eggs, any, anything with fat in it, it should be buried. Like they make in-ground composting units. Or dog. Um, yeah. <laughs> dog Perfect. Eat scraps. <laughs> But eventually it'll break down and nothing but the bones will be left. And you can actually use those. You can crush those up and that's bone meal, which is an excellent source of calcium for your plants. Um, and calcium is one of the most important 
elements for your plant health. Your plant needs to take up calcium as much as possible. So, well, that's interesting. Um, do you add lime or anything to help break down? If your soil or water is acidic, you can add add lime. But I'm always cautious with adding too much lime because it'll raise your pH. And our water here is very alkaline, and our soil here is alkaline. So we don't use lime here on the farm. But uh, I know I think the soil where you are is slightly acidic, so you could use lime sparingly. Um, but it's not necessary. As long as it's covered and underground and animals can't get to it, um, it'll eventually break down and be a, a good useful item. But keep it out of the worm bin. Okay, will do. Thank you so much, Kyle. You're welcome, we'll be in touch. Okay, bye. Bye.